freaking first cut. Golly! Welcome to the First Cut Podcast. I'm Rick Gaiman, and this is your round three recap for this week's Valspar Championship. And joining me to break it all down, Greg Ducharme is here. Hello, Greg. Rick, very uh, interesting day at the Valspar. A little slow early, and then all of a sudden, there was a little fire on the back nine, which got a little exciting. So uh, excited to talk about it with you tonight. Yeah, there was um, there was movement and a lot of it in both directions we saw things that were historic and i don't want to mislead people that does not always mean good history was made but history was made um well it was uh historically bad from an unexpected player who was kind of carrying this tournament you know i mean we'll just spoiler alert it was justin thomas uh, and I was very excited to see JT compete and get himself in the mix down the stretch. And he shot 79 today. That's not a historic number. He wasn't the only one to shoot 79 today, but the way he did it was historic. That's right. We'll get to that in just a little bit, but let's, uh, let's ease our way into the day, Greg. And we'll start with the desert fox who does is he aware that he is in florida because adam Hadwin <laughs> shot a three under 68 he had one two three separate twos on the card that's always a good thing he moves up 12 spots to a tie for eighth and he is currently four shots off the lead yeah he had a lot of really high quality shots today especially on those par threes which is uh, w- which is great to see um, he wasn't extremely accurate off the tee. And sometimes when he missed fairways, he got himself in trouble. Uh, he missed fairways on par fives and wasn't able to get up around the green in two. So he wasn't able to put the number of fours on the card that uh, that that he would have liked. Um, he did he did get up and down with a couple of those wedges. But all in all, this is a very well-rounded performance out of Adam Hadwin. And a very nice round today. And it's exactly what you need at the Valspar. You know, it, you don't have to excel anywhere. You got to keep the ball in front of you. Uh, you got to make, you, you can't compound errors when you do make them. And he didn't do that today. So I, I think his bogeys were avoidable. Some short chips, a three putt in there, uh, which you'd like to clean up for tomorrow. And if he does that and, and hits some fairways on the par fives, uh, then I think Adam Hadwin can give himself a chance. This was a nice round today. There was a combination of everybody in the field being within six shots who made the cut and also the golf course playing over par on Saturday that if you were just a couple under par, you made up a pretty decent bit on the rest of the field. Uh, I'm, I'm looking specifically at guys like Cameron Champ, who shot a four under 67 and moved up 22 spots. Ryan Moore, who shot a 67 and moved up 27 spots. Lee Hodges, who shot a 66 and moved up 45 spots. So there, there was you didn't there was you didn't have to shoot a 62. There weren't any 62s out there, but because of the way that uh, the things shook out before the cut. It, it created a very, very volatile leaderboard. And it was a, a record um, on the PGA Tour since what, like, like 1982 or 1983, uh, the tightest dispersion between players to make the cut and and um, and the top of the leaderboard. So with everybody within six shots of the lead heading into this day, you're right. It did create a lot of volatility. Everybody entered this tournament with a, with a chance to win heading into the last two days. Now, it's a very different story now. We have definitely seen some separation on the leaderboard, but the players like Ryan Moore and Cam Champ, who you mentioned, Lee Hodges, also uh, got got themselves in a much better position heading into the final round. Yeah, what I'm going to do here, Greg, because this is just a, a, a mess, but I am actually, we're going to take an early break in the show, and then that'll give us enough time to hit all these guys at the top, Justin Thomas, the Notables, all that stuff. But we'll reset after a quick word from our partners. For the last four years, I've been a prisoner of this hotel. Ah, G-sharp, I believe. Why are they keeping you here? Why do they let you live? Most of my friends are dead. My house was seized and burned. You must never leave. If you do, I'll be waiting. 
They can take away <laughs> But they can't take away who you are. And we're back. All right, Greg, let's just dive head first into this thing. We'll start at the top of the board. Keith Mitchell made the turn in one over 37. He hadn't played the snake pit yet. This was not going to be a good day for Keith Mitchell, but oh, contraire. He birdies 12. He birdies 14. He birdies 16. He birdies 17, and he holes out for Eagle from 151 yards on 18 to shoot a 29, cards a 5 under 66. He sets the new record for lowest score to par to get through the snake pit, just seven strokes, and he leapfrogs everyone to sit at the top of the board at 10 under par heading into the final round. And firmly in control of this tournament. I mean, you know, he makes a couple bogeys, uh, a nice birdie at seven, which was a bounce back after back to back bogeys. And then he missed some really good looks. Uh, nine, 10, 11 had really good opportunities. The chip in on 12 seemed to really get him going. Uh, and then he got up and down at 14 for birdie there. And then just this is the thing last week at the players. I was a big fan of Keith Mitchell. I, I was all over him. I thought he was going to have a great week because his iron play had been so sharp coming in. I mean, he had a great week at the, at the Arnold Palmer invitational with his ball striking a great week at, I believe it was the cognizant as well with his iron play and things were looking really good in the T to green camp for Keith Mitchell. Didn't play out great last week, but he comes in here and that comes to light late. It's a great shot into 16, a great shot into 17. And obviously the one at 18, if you haven't seen it, you got to check out the replay because this is one hop in the bottom. He got something in his eye after the divot. It was uh, just an awesome moment. And again, like the way you tack this golf course, it can lead to some boring golf. You know, it, it asks for boring golf, especially in conditions like this. It's hard to get it close out there. And Keith Mitchell knocks it in and I stand up out of my chair. I, I made make an audible noise. I was stunned that it went in. Uh, so that was a really cool moment. Kind of uh, lit the fire in my house. The um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going on the record. And I'm going to say this is an unbreakable record. Okay. So, so he's the first guy to play the snake pit at four under. So he goes birdie, birdie, eagle. We know that that is like one of the most difficult stretches in golf. I don't think we'll ever see a five under stretch there. You'd have to go, you'd have to go, you have to make two eagles. So you'd either have to like a 17 or hole out on both 16 and 18 and birdie 17. Right. No five. No way. I mean, you'd never say never, but I would be absolutely. I'm stunned to see four under in this stretch. I agree. Uh, I mean, it's it's very challenging. Uh, and so to think that somebody's going to hold two shots and make a birdie on the other one, it, it's hard to imagine. Uh, but, you know, I was texting you guys in, in the group chat. Maybe Kashmir Keith gets a new nickname, the Snake Charmer. Yeah. And Hixie said it at the end of the broadcast, too. So he was right there with me. The oh, Snake Charmer, yeah. Kashmir Keith. Did you just reveal to everyone that Hicks is in our group chat? <laughs> He's not in our group chat. I, I wish he was. It'd be very entertaining if he was, um, but I'm sure he wouldn't use any of my material on the air if he was. Uh, you know, if he wins, you could say something like, uh, he's got the antidote or something <laughs> like that. Right? Like we could, we'll to, we'll yeah, I got to do a little look, a little digging on that. What do you do for Venom? I, yeah. uh, you, you suck it out, I think, is what you do. I don't know. We'll have to, yeah. We'll have to that out. It seems risky, but. I wouldn't do it. Log jam right behind Keith Mitchell. Two shots back, three players. Three shots back, three players. So add it up. That's six. Let's start with the eight unders. Mackenzie Hughes follows up his 68 on Thursday with a 68 on Friday and a 69 on Saturday. This was going pretty swimmingly. Greg, three under through 11. He did find a little bit of trouble coming in with bogeys on 13 and 18. He was playing from out of position quite a bit, but he's going to get to go to sleep tonight. Just two shots off the pace. You think of um, you, you think of Mackenzie Hughes, and I looked at his name. His form coming in hasn't been stellar. 
not a lot of signs that this was going to be a great week, except it's a good course fit for him because he is a grinder. Uh, he he's not the longest; it's gotten longer. Um, he's not overly accurate either, and and these are the kind of you know it, it's a little perplexing at times because you think okay if you're short you got to be really straight if especially if you've had success on tour like Mackenzie Hughes has these but he's not necessarily I mean he hit it so far right at 18. I'm surprised they even found the ball. I mean, it went miles right. And he can do that kind of thing. But what he's so good at is figuring out a way to put a score on the the board. Uh, The putter is hot right now. He's leading the field in strokes game putting. Hit a great putt at 17 that stopped just short in in the heart. Uh, Made a, what, a 40-footer at 16. So... uh, of the guys in this leaderboard, you got a couple guys doing it with their tee to green play and their ball striking. Uh, Mackenzie Hughes is the guy that's doing it with his putter. Mackenzie Hughes in that log jam. Seamus Power also in this log jam. A 68 for him as well on Saturday. And Greg, I think you know you zoom out a little bit. Seamus Power has not had a good 2024. His 2023 wasn't that great. We've seen him play well for long extended periods of time uh but we haven't seen it in a while no uh, and he's been really cold on the greens and according to his caddy that is he's kind of found a little life with the putter and today wasn't his best day on the greens he had a great day thursday uh, and made 100 feet of putts in yesterday's round as well today was uh, it was a little cooler but he didn't really need to make a whole lot of putts you know Seamus power today was really smart he kept his ball in control uh, he flighted it really nicely when he needed to this looked like the Seamus power that we're used to seeing um so i really liked what he did t to green today i really liked what he did with his iron play today and it was a simple looking 68 you know he did he played the the boring golf that you need to play at the copperhead course um and and feeling a little more confident on the greens is definitely a, a nice added bonus and why he's sitting here, you know, two shots back of the lead. Peter Mountain Audio also there at eight under par. Uh, no offense, Peter. We're just going to skip you. Go down to the sevens. Uh, uh, go out and win tomorrow. We'll talk a, a lot about you. Cam Young in with a 68, three shots off the pace. And Greg, this was going sideways out of the gate. He was two over par with three bogeys through his first six holes. And then he gets the spark that he needs. He holds out from 121 yards in the fairway on number seven for Eagle. And that just spurs the rest of this round here birdies on 9 11 12 and 14 he does give one back at 15 but he plays the the snake pit at even par so he gets in with a three under 68 and that three under that three shots is the gap between him and keith mitchell it's a a nice round of golf for him today puts him in contention heading into tomorrow there's still some things he does that are a little on the sloppy side you know, he, he gains two shots approaching the green today, but the hole out is a big benefit in that. He did hit some loose iron shots, has been driving it really well. Uh, but the, big, the biggest concern with Cam Young is what he does around the greens. And all of these bogeys come from, you know, I, I don't want to say that they're easy because you can get some strange lies in, these, in, in the rough around these greens, um, which he did on the last, what was that, on, uh, on 15 the last bogey he made, he had a really squirrely lie. It was a, a difficult up and down. Um, but there's a lot of those kind of short chips from around the greens that he's just, he's not as good as other PGA tour players. And it's amazing that he's able to come up with the record he is in major championships. Cause this has been a weakness. So for Cam Young tomorrow, because of what he can do off the tee, he has the ability to go out there and, take over this tournament with the driver Uh, but he also has he's got to hit a lot of greens i i was thinking at first all right let's go out there and just fire at flag sticks and overwhelm the golf course with your ball striking but i I think he's got to play away from those short-sighted misses a little bit because the he he will drop shots if he misses greens and um I, i i ultimately i think cam young taking advantage of par fives 
and getting the ball on the green in regulation is going to go a long way for him tomorrow. Yeah, play away from those weaknesses and stick to your strength. So Cam Young at seven under, Brendan Todd at seven under, and Chandler Phillips at seven under. And Greg, I want to highlight him because we've probably not spent much time, if any, time talking about Chandler Phillips. He's a rookie. He's out of Texas A&M. He played at that program. This week, he is ninth in the field in strokes gained approach. He's gained over four strokes there. Another four and a half with the putter. That's a very good high upside combo. Today, he had four birdies, three bogeys, including a square on number 18, his final hole of the day. So he kept himself in it, beat the field average. What have you made of his game so far this week? Well, I really like the golf swing. That's for one. But this is only his, what, 11th event on the PGA Tour? Yeah. Uh, so not a lot of experience out there. Did win on the Corn Ferry Tour last year, uh, which is how he got onto the PGA Tour. Played nice at the American Express and, and in Mexico. He's got top 25s in both of those events. So this is an opportunity for him to really change his career, change his life. Uh, and we could get a pretty good story because I like what I see with this golf swing. Uh, the putter does seem to be a little bit of an issue. Uh, apparently, he had 10 putters out at the beginning of the week, trying them out, trying to find one that worked. And it looks so far like it, like he's got one. A couple short misses today, um, but but we'll see what happens tomorrow with, uh, with all that pressure on, because this is a big opportunity for him. 10 putters? Why not 12 putters, Greg? If you're going to try well, 10, you might as well try 12. Yeah, I mean, the, the, it's probably in those next two that was the golden ticket. Speaking of putters, speaking of oh. finding a, a golden ticket, if you are looking for Justin Thomas's name, because Justin Thomas was he was the favorite last night, wasn't he? Well, he was one off the lead. I imagine he was the favorite. It was like five, five to one or six to one or something like that. Um, was the favorite to win. He was one shot off the lead. Uh, if you're looking for his name, keep. Keep scrolling. You'll you'll get there eventually. Uh, you'll find it in a tie for 66 after a, a a 79 that was a historically sour putting round, Greg. So let me put this into perspective for you here. He lost over seven strokes putting. It's by far the worst round of Justin Thomas's career. Um, I've got about 230,000 measured rounds in my database back to 2008 there's only maybe three dozen that are worse than this so he's probably it's like 34th out of 200 and something thousand by any player he rolled in a birdie putt from two feet nine inches so he tapped it in on the first hole he made he did not make a putt longer than that for the rest of the day no there was only one other one putt uh which was from just outside of just outside of two feet. I, I, he made that one from two feet, nine inches. He made another one that was from two feet, four inches. Okay, we're splitting hairs here. I think you get the gist of it. It's 38 putts. It's four, three putts. I, I counted five missed putts inside of six feet on the front nine. This is the lid completely on. We made 22 feet of, of total. 22 total feet of putts made. It's hard to do that in 18 holes. Right? I mean, because you're going to tap it in. Uh, this is um, atrociously bad. And the round of golf wasn't a 79 kind of round. I was, I was, I was like, what is he going to say? I thought he was going to like, it wasn't that bad. It was actually pretty good. I didn't know what you were going to say when well, you started. A, a normal putting day and Justin Thomas probably, I mean, I'm not, he, he didn't play great. He didn't hit it great, but he didn't hit it that he didn't hit it 79 bad. Yeah. He, he, sh he should have shot like a 72. Yeah. It could have turned it in with his typical game. Could have turned it into 70, right? Somewhere, somewhere in that range. And it's 79 and it's, it's all because of the greens all a hundred percent. So I know la at the end of last year, he stepped away from his putting coach, John Graham, was trying to take things into his own hands a little bit. And I, I'm i wondering if, um, I know it's only one round, but what do you do from here? This is, the, this is where you need to have a coach to lean on. 
And I know he could talk to his dad. There's a lot of people he can talk to about this, but um, it, it's a sign of kind of being lost. And that's concerning going forward. So look, this happens. You can have a bad day. I know it's a historically bad day, um, but what, how Justin Thomas rebounds specifically with the putter, it's, it's really important because there's only two tournaments until the first major championship of the year. And at the beginning of this year, Justin Thomas was looking like a guy ready to vie for some majors. And we're suddenly slipping into a pretty bad place. And I don't know who he turns to for help without a, without a putting coach. So yeah, this is a, this is concerning. We have just pinballed, or at least I have pinballed back and forth this year on my kind of thoughts on Justin Thomas, right? End of last year, awesome. Start of this year, awesome. Then he misses two of his last three cuts, and I'm a little bit worried about that. Then he goes out, and after two rounds this week, he's got me. I'm back. I'm fully back in. He's one off the lead. We're getting ready for major championship season. He's the favorite to win. Now he has the, like, yeah, I like a loss putting round at the most important stretch of golf during the year. And now I'm back to terrified again. I, I cannot, my, my, um, you know, feel for him has, has, has changed so much in just like four weeks. You know, I, I kind of, I, I think I said this maybe in the DFS episode where it'd be really easy. You could see this story building where you could look back at this year at the end of a really good year for Justin Thomas and say, okay, we well, missed the cut at the Genesis. He played with tiger. He missed the cut at the players. Well, a lot of great players missed the cut at the players championship. You can kind of write those off. And so I was willing to take a chance on him this week. And at the beginning of the week in the first two rounds, it was, it was absolutely paying off. Um, but to see something like this, it makes you wonder if those, those two events at the Genesis were really a, a sign of something more. Um, the, the event at the Genesis and the players. Yeah. I, I had excuses for those two. Right. I don't and have excuses for this one. Yeah. Now, it, now it's kind of hard because look, the players on Friday at the players, he lost, I think, three strokes putting. Mm -hmm. yeah, that was the reason he missed that cut. And that's, and that's a horrible, horrible day of putting. This was, this was more than twice as bad as that. Yeah. 22 feet of putts made in 18 holes. Oof, boy. Okay. Um, let's readjust to the top of the board and Josh will show us the odds with 18 holes to go here. Keith Mitchell, uh, plus 190 is your favorite. He's two shots clear. Mac Hughes is uh, one of the closest chaser. He's next at plus 650. Cam Young, three shots back at seven and a half to one. Seamus, seven and a half to one. Uh, then everybody else is in double digits. What are you going to, what do you trust on a Saturday evening like this? Well, Justin Thomas is only 13 back. Um, I'm kidding. But Keith Mitchell is the the guy right now. If, if you look at stats, and it's going to get pretty windy tomorrow afternoon. So you're thinking, okay, bad conditions. We want to go to ball strikers. Well, that's going to be Keith Mitchell. You don't like those odds. And in really difficult conditions, I typically wouldn't go for the guy that's doing it all with the putter. That would be Mackenzie Hughes. But I think Mackenzie Hughes has more tools in the toolbox than just the putter. I think he can figure out a way. So I'm okay with Hughes. I'm okay with Mitchell. I don't think Cam Young is really... Uh, ready yet. I hope he makes me eat my words. I would love nothing more than to see that, but I, I don't love Cam Young at, at plus 750. So go, getting away from Mitchell and Hughes, I, I think the next best option is probably Seamus Power uh, at eight under. I think that's actually a pretty good number on him. Uh, he plays well in windy, difficult conditions. He's got something going with the putter. He's at least got a spark of confidence with that club. And I think his TD green game is ready to handle what tomorrow is going to throw at him. Oh boy, this is actually, this is quite difficult. I, I I'm with you on Cam Young. I, I don't think I'm quite ready for that yet. I could make a tiny little case for some of these other guys. I think if you made me bet it and I rarely do this, I think it's, I think it's Keith. I think it's Keith two shots clear 
plus 190. And I don't love betting a guy that short, but that is where my head is saying to go right about now. That's where, it, I mean, he, it, you got to take the guy who's going to win, right? The odds don't matter if he wins or if he doesn't win, I mean. But he's leading in strokes gained tee to green. He's third in strokes gained off the tee. He's first in strokes gained uh, approach the green. He's losing over two shots with the putter. Yeah. And he's leading by two. He doesn't have to have a good putting day tomorrow. Right? He's got to hit fairways and greens, which he said in his post-round presser. So, yeah, Keith Mitchell looks like the guy. The other thing, Rick, that I don't really like going after is like the, the great round. He just goes out and shoots 29 with a hole out eagle. I, I don't like chasing that. That being said, he's two shots clear. That's a pretty it's a pretty big edge. We don't need to see a phenomenal. I mean, two under might be enough tomorrow. Yeah, I don't know if I trust any of those other guys. Uh, real quick before we get out of here. So so the 10 most expensive golfers on DraftKings. So in theory, that the 10 best players in this field before the week. Um, the the 10 guys, nine thousand dollars or more expensive. Six of them missed the cut. Sam Burns, Jordan Spieth, Brian Harmon, Sung J M, Tony Finau, Min Woo Lee. One of them is inside the top 30. That's Cam Young. The rest are between the other three are between 30th and 70th. Uh, not a good week for the big boys. No. And it looked like it was a good week. It, it looked like it was going to be a good week for the big boys. You know, Sam Burns had it going early on Thursday. Uh, you had um Brian Harmon was kind of fighting it, but he was still there. He shot even in the opening round. You had JT, had Spieth playing all right after round one. And it, they just go sideways. And Xander was like still lurk. Like Xander being, you know, T19, T18 or whatever after the first two rounds. Like, okay, he's lurking again. Whatever. Right. But w within what? Within four or five shots. Exactly. Right there. Look, it's a tough golf course. And I, I don't think that they really had I, I don't know if any of them really were coming in on their game like even xander who's coming off of a second at the players is working on his swing and he, he kind of made it work at the players which is what he said i uh, did a lot of it with short game that's hard to keep up for eight rounds uh jt we've had our questions with was coming off a miscut brian Harmon had the electric tournament at the players sometimes that kind of emotional roller coaster of contention can lead to some trouble so it, it's understandable now looking back um but it's still disappointing final three groups cam young brendan todd mackenzie hughes peter malnati and the final group keith mitchell seamus power in round four of the valspar championship we'll be back after the conclusion of this event to discuss all the happenings but for now big thanks to producer josh who does all the hard work behind the scenes that right there that's greg ducharme you can find him on twitter at the real gfd and you can find me at rick run good this has been the first cut we'll catch you next time